communism. Just so everybody knows, we are um, going live on Facebook um, in just a minute or so. And just the presentation portion will be live and then the discussion will be will no longer be streaming on Facebook. Um, yeah, go ahead and put your uh, your introduction in the chat so people can get a sense of who all is here. Um, and we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Okay, so it looks like we're live uh, on Facebook streaming. Um, uh, as mentioned before, only the presentation will be live, so the, the discussion will be private. I wanna welcome everybody to this meeting presented by Tempest Collective, uh, Labor Under Biden, The Case for Class Struggle Unionism. We have a great set of speakers who I will introduce in just a minute, but in the, uh, in the tradition of labor solidarity, we're gonna have a couple solidarity messages um, coming from uh, Virgilio from NYU graduate students and Jonathan Bailey from Amazonians United. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. My name is uh, Virgilio Urbina. Uh, thank you to Jessica, to Natalia and to Tempest for putting this wonderful panel together and for inviting me to give a very short report back. So I am a steward in GSOC UAW Local 2110, which is the union representing graduate student workers, research assistants, teaching assistants, course assistants over at NYU. I was also a member of the bargaining committee for GSOC in this past union fight, contract fight, I should say, uh, in which we just secured a tentative agreement less than three weeks ago a tentative agreement that we think is quite historic in its achievements for graduate student workers across the sector. And we hope it'll inspire uh, other graduate workers to win the wins that we did. Um, I just wanted to maybe briefly talk about what we accomplished in this contract and how we did so and sort of a few short lessons that to a lot of people here will seem familiar, but nonetheless are worth remembering even under uh, our current regime. So this contract, which is a five-year contract, has won a 30% base hourly pay increase in its first year, retroactive, which will increase to a 50% increase by the end of the life of the contract. It created a completely new out-of-pocket healthcare fund that did not exist before. It created a new legal plan for international and ex-convict students to reach out to, which used to be reserved entirely for faculty and other full-time employees. And it won a greater number of protections for power-based harassment, affirmative action and other matters of equity and inclusion that we thought was important in creating a greater community of interest in our membership. So I wanna maybe briefly talk about the strike which took place between April 26 and concluded on March 14. This was a three week strike that we had prepared for for over nine months in advance. And it took as much preparation as it did because we in the union in the bargaining committee as well as in the core organizing group understood that in the age of the pandemic in Zoom, it was not enough to take for granted that our graduate workers and our membership um, was willing to fight for a contract, but that we wanted to secure positive and enthusiastic buy-in in, in our project, which we did through multiple different campaigns of escalation. And we did through political education, one-on-one -on -one calls, even occasionally having meetups in parks or in other places that could allow for social distance um, political education. It was a gargantuan effort and one which we weren't sure of its success. Uh, but once we hit the picket line, suddenly all of those barriers that NYU had put forward to us as why they couldn't concede on out-of-pocket costs, on hourly weights, et cetera, suddenly they seemed to melt as the picket line remained strong. And more important, I think it built collective power in our union moving forward because we created as open as a decision-making process and in a participation process as possible. What did that mean? Concretely, it meant open bargaining sessions. It meant having roles within the picket line and within the strike, within phone banking and et cetera, uh, that any union member could participate and get plugged in. It meant con concisive and very intense onboarding for new members, regardless of whether or not they had just heard about the union, whether they had been following the union for several years. 
And it also meant having a bargaining committee, myself included, that repeatedly did town halls, membership meetings, even occasionally office hours, so to speak, so that if anyone had questions about our demands or the state of negotiations, at least one member of the bargaining committee would be there to respond. And three weeks later, um, we came out with this tentative agreement, which is currently under ratification vote. I think the last thing that I would urge people to remember about pulling off a strike is that it's a tactic that requires a lot of preparation, but it's also one that not only wins greater victories by withholding our labor, but creates a memory and hopefully a precedent for other bargaining units around the city and around the country to follow. And this will not be the only uh, event in which I'll be speaking. I'm also gonna be speaking in a number of other graduate student worker unions events um, because they saw what we got done and they compared it to what has not been able to get done in other parts and they wanna find out the lessons. So thank you again for Tempest for having me uh, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Virgilio. We next. You're muted. Jessica, you're muted. So um, while Jessica figures out the uh, tech stuff, I'll turn it over to Jonathan Bailey from Amazonians United. It's because they, it's because Natalia muted me. Hey, hey y'all. Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's good to be here. Um, uh, all right, so, um, yeah, my name is Jonathan Bailey. Um, I'm a worker at uh, the Amazon warehouse here in Woodside, Queens. Um, uh, I I've been there for uh, actually coming coming up on two years now. Um, you know, we uh, as Amazonians United, we um, launched uh, here in New York City um, uh, publicly. Actually, after like soon, uh, shortly before. Uh, the pandemic um, after we we had realized that uh, that Amazon was stealing our sick leave from us um, and we, we we quickly realized that that was an issue that we could actually organize around um, and so um, through uh, a lot of the type of organizing that um, is very familiar to y'all like starting with petitions uh, building that sentiment, um, like building uh, with with coworkers so that uh, we had the the sufficient amount of, of of trust and confidence within the workplace. Um, we were able to actually move towards start starting to like take part in actions uh, through like and and um, through through different actions like marches on the boss, um, uh, you know, uh, worker slowdowns. And uh, e even uh, a, a spontaneous strike, um, we were able to win a lot of the demands that we had, um, including uh, winning back our sick time, uh, winning uh, paid time off, not just for uh, workers here in New York, um, but in conjunction with other Amazonians United chapters across the US, uh, win paid time off for all delivery station workers uh, in Amazon throughout the US. Um, which has been like really awesome and really exciting. Um, one of the things that has kind of come out of that though is, uh, you know, we've like really got to see the way that Amazon uh, retaliates um, and kind of the way that Amazon sees, uh, sees like, you sees labor relations. You can really see within Amazon this like legacy, uh, this like very old legacy of labor relations in the US. Um, you know, I, I, you know, when I started, I worked in, uh, our, our warehouse was 90% black. Um, and, you know, since my time there, we've made uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, over $100 billion. 
um, you know, many of these workers like, um, like, you know, I, we're making just like over minimum wage for, for the vast majority of our time there. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that the one of the things though that is most exciting about Amazon um, is its potential um, to, to really be an engine of, um, of radical, of, of radicalization, of, of uh, developing uh, skills around, um, you know, uh, of building working class power. Um, folks stay in an Amazon warehouse for an average of, of six months. Um, and it's, it's, they're, they're predominantly, it, it's one of the places that capitalism puts black and brown people. And so for us to be successful, for us to um, be able to develop, uh, uh, you know, developing the ability to help people go from no uh, reference for class struggle to being um, like committed organizers who are able to uh, create strategy and execute it, um, you know, would actually help Amazon warehouses turn into engines of of um, developing uh, shop floor militants. Um, and uh, in, in such a way that's actually rooted in uh, not just the working class, but specifically in uh, uh, communities of colonized people in the US. So um, that's like a super exciting opportunity. I'm super happy to be at Amazon um, and with Amazonians United. And um, thank you so much for inviting me here. Looking forward to, uh, to working with y'all in the future. Thank you so much, Jonathan. We really appreciate. Um, really, we really appreciate, appreciate you you sending those messages of solidarity to us. Um, we're going to get started with our panel of speakers, um, and we're going to get started with Donna Merch, who is an associate professor of history at Rutgers University, is the author of Living for the City: Migration, Education, and the Rise of the Black Panther Party in Oakland and the forthcoming Asada Taught Me, State Violence, Mass Incarceration, and the Movement for Black Lives. Please everyone welcome Donna Merch. Hi everybody. Is it possible to unshare the screens just so that I can see everyone? It's so much easier to talk to human beings rather than to a uh, PowerPoint slide. Hi everybody. I wanna thank the organizers. I'm really honored to be here. I also wanted to thank for Helio and Jonathan for their updates. Very, very inspiring. Expressing, I would like to express some solidarity, which I'll be talking about today. And I'm honored to be on this panel. So I'm timing myself. So let me get my timer going so I won't go over. Um, so I'm here uh, really wearing my union hat I'm on the executive council of the Rutgers AAUP AFT. I've been on the executive council for two years. And for the last three years, I've been the department rep for the history department. And it's been incredibly inspiring to me. Absolutely one of the most important things that I've done in my life and in my career. So um, recently I wrote a piece uh, about, Amazon, about the aftermath of the Amazon victory. And it was an attempt to contextualize what had happened in Amazon, but also to remind all of us that there have been a number of labor victories that are not covered by the mainstream media. One of the things I found particularly frustrating about the Amazon campaign is that it's very hard to get labor reporting into the mainstream media. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the way that I wrote that piece, because that piece wasn't just a kind of intellectual or academic piece. That piece was written in the context of me as the media co-chair with a graduate student, Danielle Ferrari, as the other chair of the media narrative committee in our union and our union coalition. And I really wanted to get the word out about our memorandum of understanding and a huge victory that we won during the pandemic and couldn't get covered by the mainstream press. Um, so, I wanted to place um, our union, our higher education union in the context of really an important shift that has happened in labor. It's not new. We could easily trace it back to the 1970s or earlier, but I think there's been a real intensification over the last decade. And that is the importance of public sector unionism led by women in care professions. So, 
the incredible victories of the Chicago Teachers Union, the Los Angeles UTLA, and then very importantly, in conservative right to work Trump stronghold states, Oklahoma and West Virginia. So I think that one of the things that we are constantly battling is really a kind of anachronistic understanding of labor that privileges male breadwinners and the male breadwinner ideal and industrial shop floor organizing. Right now, manufacturing is 5% of the US economy. And certainly if we look at the kind of right-wing mobilization and Trumpism, much of that has a kind of nostalgia, you know, for the Fordist, you know, industrialization centered in big industries, but that's no longer the nature of the US workforce or US political economy. So um, in the coalition of Rutgers unions, we draw a lot of our inspiration from the organizing of K through 12 teachers and other care workers, most importantly, the Chicago Teachers Union. And for that piece, I had the pleasure, thanks to Sherry Wolf who's on the call, of getting to talk to one of my biggest heroes, Stacey Davis Gates and to talk to her about the kind of organizing they've been doing under COVID and also just the larger trajectory of the Chicago Teachers Union. And she told me a story that was really about this radicalization and the coming to power after a catastrophic event, which I think is important for us in thinking about the COVID and labor under Biden. And that was Rahm Emanuel closing 50 schools that overwhelmingly serviced black and brown students. And it was that kind of shock to the system that really um, made a group of activists that decide that there had to be a pivot in the Chicago Teachers Union. So they really provided a model that we have used. We use everything from their solidarity principles to their conception of bargaining for the common good, which is an argue, argument that I think, I just can't stress how important it is, both practically and also politically, which is the idea that labor struggles have to be rooted in geographic, physical places of community. So looking at the conditions of the students and how that relates to the conditions of the workplace. So it was the Chicago Teachers Union that pioneered the idea that our working conditions are your students' learning conditions. Um, so I wanted to talk about kind of that history of the, the Chicago Teachers Union and then bridge that to what's been happening at Rutgers. So over the course, I'd say of a decade, um, Rutgers itself has been a union that has been transformed. And former president Deepa Kumar, who I know is close to many of you, played a crucial role in this and thinking about how to bring forward a left-led leadership inspired by some of the victories of UPS workers. And I enter the struggle relatively late, I guess somewhere around 2017, after we saw real organizers inside the union do the process of creating a department rep, rep structure, a union steward rep uh, structure of really getting rank and file organizing and you know, growing the union. And over a course of 10 years, we've had an enormous growth. Our open rates of our emails was 300 around 2011, 2012. It's now between 1,000 and 1,500 regularly and sometimes higher. So I wanted to shout out Virgilio and all of the things that he was saying. Amazing, we did the same thing. So important department rep structure, town halls, office hours, ways to make the union integral to everyone else. Um, so uh, I guess I would conclude by saying, there's a real problem with the failure to cover labor. I wrote the piece that I did because I saw it as the only way to get it into the mainstream media. I couldn't write it simply as a successful labor victory. I framed it in terms of the movement for black lives, which has been incredibly important to us. And it's part of our vision of racial and gender justice. Um, but, you know, one of the ways that the media damages the labor movement is that they don't do any coverage and then they take a single campaign struggle, often one that is faded. You know, Jane McElvey and many others were um, predicting the failure of the NLRB election there. So they put all this weight and then they make the, the weight of the labor movement rise and fall in a single campaign. 
Meanwhile, at Rutgers, we've won these incredible victories. We can't get any of them into the New York Times. I was able to place them in the Guardian just through my own personal contacts. But I think I want that to be part of our discussion. You know, we have a wonderful graduate organizer, Ian Gavigan, and I was talking to him about it. He's writing a history of socialists in the Delaware Valley. And he was talking about how in the post-war period, you essentially had a union counterpart to, um, uh, to uh, what is it called? The Associated Press. And it was funded by the labor movement so that it could place, place articles in the local press. We don't have that. And so since I'm here with the Tempest Collective who's done such amazing political education, we need more labor press. Um, and I guess I'll just conclude where I did with my piece which is, um, I used a quote uh, from Martin Luther King, which is one that we've been searching for different ways to articulate our own vision. And it was Martin Luther King that argued that a union was the very first anti-poverty program. Absolutely essential. Looking to the future, I see the most important wedding is if we're fighting racial capitalism is to bring together the movement for black lives with a revived labor movement in which public sector female workers in care industries are understood as the vanguard as the wonderful Sarah Nelson has demonstrated to us in so many ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. That was excellent and a great way to get this discussion going. Um, next, we have Joe Burns, who is a former local union president, active in strike solidarity, is a labor negotiator and an attorney. He is the author of Reviving the Strike, How Working People Can Regain Power and Transform America. Go ahead, Joe. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, and I've enjoyed the previous speakers. And uh, let me just uh, set my alarm <laughs> since I'm uh, eight minutes. OK, so um, this is actually a topic that is uh, uh, one that I've been thinking a lot in the last uh, couple of years. I'm currently writing a book that's coming out through Haymarket uh, titled Class Struggle Unionism. Um, and one of the things I've done is, uh, you know, I've kind of looked back kind of like I did in my book, Reviving the Strike, where I looked back in history to argue that the strike was essential for reviving the labor movement. Similarly, I think we can look back at labor history and come to the conclusion that developing a widespread trend of class struggle unionism is essential to labor's future. And um, if you look back historically with, uh, you know, in labor history, the, the great divide in terms of forms of unionism was between what was called business unionism and class struggle unionism. Now, business unionism, it, I think the term was a lot broader than it's come to mean in recent decades. In recent decades, we think of a subset of unions that are just, you know, sort of corrupt and, you know, narrowly focused their members. But historically, the divide was a bit bigger, and it, it really hinged on, you know, what is your view of the workplace transaction and the system of capitalism? And the business unionists, and you think of the old American Federation of Labor and sort of the, you know, going forward, the mainstream uh, AFL-CIO unions, uh, you know, their view could be captured more under the slogan of a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. They basically saw their job as improving the conditions often for the narrow um, group of workers that they represented, uh, but functioning custom, um, uh, comfortably within the overall economic framework. Uh, the class struggle unionists, and if you look at them, you, uh, if you look at the class struggle unionists, there's really a, a, a different view. And that, you know, you look from the industrial workers of the, of the world in the uh, 1910s and, and beyond, the left-led unions in the 1930s, uh, 20s and 30s, um, you know, sort of the, the Communist Party and other so socialist groups, uh, leaders of the 34 trucker strike and so forth and the great upsurges. 
And then you even go forward past that and you get to the 1970s and when you have these sort of campus and social movement radicals entering the workplace with a very defined philosophy, um, forming caucuses, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, all of this great work that was done. And their view is a little bit different. And the view is that um, the workplace transaction is inherently exploitive. Uh, that labor creates all wealth, but that wealth goes to a handful of people. Um, and that's how we get millionaire, billionaire, millionaires and billionaires. And that viewpoint, viewing the workplace transaction as fundamentally exploitative and being opposed to the system is, is what you can think of as the fundamental point of class struggle unionism and everything else I'm going to talk to flows from that fundamental point. Um, because they saw that transaction in a particular way, these unions viewed their, their struggles not as isolated battles, but as part of a larger class struggle of the working class against the exploiting class. And because of that, um, they really developed a, a systematic uh, philosophy, um, a class struggle set of ideas that you really can look through all the unions and pull some commonalities. I'm only gonna have the time in this discussion to briefly touch on them, but um, I'm just gonna hit a few of them. It really, uh, one of the principles is really this, what, what the United Electrical Workers talk about as them and us. It's this idea that uh, workers and management have irreconcilable differences. Uh, that on every issue, uh, our interests are opposed to their interests. And that goes a lot against what you hear in the labor movement, even in the progressive you know, trends of it, um, that kind of downplay that fundamental antagonism. It doesn't matter what it is, um, our interests are opposed. Another fundamental principle that often gets lost is this idea that the working class shall free itself. Um, it's fundamental to sort of left or socialist philosophy that um, that the workers uh, need to free themselves and it's not going to be a case of middle class folks coming in and doing that for them. And because of this, if you look back on the sort of left led union or uh, they really focused on union reform movements. They focused on when they did get in power in unions in terms of having democratic structures, look at the, um, you know, sort of consistently over time. Uh, they, they, they really prioritize the, the sort of uh, working class leadership of the movements. Um, the other principle, because they see this transaction as inherently exploitive, the fight for the shop floor has a real importance. It's not just about wages and wage increases, um, but it's uh, very much uh, centered in, uh, in, in, um, fighting exploitation in the workplace. Uh, you know, beyond that, I'm gonna run out of time pretty quickly, um, but it leads to, you know, this sort of idea that class struggle unionists are fighting for the working class, um, anti-racist struggles being key, internationalism um, as, as being very integral to unionism and not just issues that are off on the side. Um, it flows beyond that in terms of class struggle tactics in terms of how do you view the, the government and the role of the National Labor Relations Board and the state. If you view us involved in a class struggle, you view um, the, these institutions. I think uh, the class struggle unionists uh, look skeptically upon uh, government institutions. Um, but it also leads to a whole set of ideas about organizing and what the role of uh, you know, sort of working class militants is in the movement. Um, it's, it's not, you know, the sort of organizing approach that you hear today, but more folks integrating with the, with the struggle, building rank and file reform movements and so forth. Um, finally, I'm going to, uh, you know, just uh, touch on one more point. And uh, one of the concerns I have is that in recent decades, uh, there has been a tendency which uh, I call labor liberalism, which has developed. And really from the 1990s on, and this is a, this is a, a form of unionism which has a lot of benefits because folks talk about, you know, having progressive issues on social movements, doing more organizing and so forth. 
Um, and I think it can be told fly by, you know, like the Service Employees International Union the, in the 1990s and beyond, where they did a lot of good work, but then they also focus on the fake strikes and undemocratic structures and so forth. A lot of the worker center movements, you know, have some strengths, but they also have weaknesses. And I think we have to look critically on progressive trade unionism over the last couple of decades um, with the idea of, you know, how do they tie into uh, and stack up with the traditional class struggle union ideals? So, uh, you know, just to, uh, you know, start wrap, uh, just to wrap it up, um, I think that we're in a very exciting time in the labor movement. Um, we have uh, seen in recent decades, you know, a whole generation of folks, uh, you know, uh, uh, embracing the strike and militancy as the, as the key point uh, to revive the labor movement. Um, we have the development of very important social movements uh, that, uh, you know, folks rightfully look towards. Uh, uh, the the movement against uh, uh, police brutality and terror. And I think that it's really important to have discussions like this about how do we deepen our understanding of trade unionism? How do we move past, uh, you know, the sort of forms that we've seen in uh, recent decades and deepen them and uh, develop a widespread uh, trend of class struggle unionism? because ultimately that's the only way we're going to revive the labor movement. Okay, thanks folks. Thank you so much, Joe. That was great. We look forward to your upcoming book. Um, next we have Paul Kirk Davidoff, a grocery worker, union member, and socialist activist in Minneapolis. Uh, Paul is a member of the Tempest Collective, Twin Cities DSA, UFCW 1189, and co-founder of DSA's Restaurant Organizing Project. Go ahead, Paul. Hey, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Great. Um, yeah, so just to get started, um, I figured that um, uh, I'd talk a little bit about what we've been up to the last year in the Restaurant Organizing Project. So for the first time, service workers you know, last year, we're all together in crisis, right? We're all mostly out of a job. So using kind of DSA as an incubator, we started this kind of inchoate mix of radical workers all over the country. And from the start, we did something that I'm really proud of, which is that we made it a space where 95% of the talking, I'd say is from regular service workers. And we realized early on, this was a rare thing, especially in organizing circles, that there wasn't a professional organizer there to guide things or anything. So we've been chugging along, having some successes, getting local groups set up in different cities. What we've noticed, though, is that while we can get some great workers to get on a call and hang out and learn from their fellow workers, and we think that's really definitely important, uh, when we're getting people that will actually stick around and organize in their own communities, it's in places where there are already infrastructures there. Cities with big labor movements like Chicago, NYC, Portland, but also places with lots of socialists like Austin, Ann Arbor, because these are young workers and doing long-term work is hard, right? especially year, uh, in a year like 2020, which was the year of short-term thinking, right? right? So if you don't have support networks, unless you're really dedicated, it's hard to just stick to one thing. So you get tired and worn out and you quit your, quit your job, do something else. And on the other hand, when there is a city with like one labor veteran or like DSA guy or whatever, who is like, let's organize some restaurants, that didn't work at all because these people had no connection to the community, didn't know where to go, who to talk to, and the service workers, frankly, didn't really give a crap about them. So I think that's a great example of this interplay. Um, and I we're gonna and I think a, a great example is where I'm living out here in Minneapolis. So let's back up and give some detail. We have a Unite Here local out here that had lost a lot of membership and was being run by some really awful classic bureaucrats. And some staffers and rank and file members a few years ago were just so mad and tired about this. They took over the union um, running on this slate they called Democratic Local 17. So they set about changing their local, hiring some organizers, actually getting some good contracts for once, and decided that they were going to be open to organizing anywhere in the service industry, not just hotels. One of the reasons they were thinking this is that they thought, saw where the mind of the industry was. There had been a big effort to win 15, and there were a lot of maybe lefty-oriented people in the industry, but the organizing was kind of slow. It was slow, that is, I will say, until after the uprising. And that's when the organizing really started to pop off when a group of workers at a distillery, Tattersall Distillery out here in Minneapolis, decided to form a union because they had been in the streets and then came back to work and realized that the boss 
wasn't going to do a shit about hiring a more diverse workforce. So they called up the union and they got signed cards and they had a big rally in front of the place where like 200 service workers, mostly unorganized, showed up. And then a month later, they won their union. So a few places followed that with some wins and a couple tough losses. And what united all of them was that the campaigns were driven by the workers themselves and really tapped into the energy of the uprisings that the youth felt. But they had a union to really back them up and a labor movement and a socialist movement to mobilize for them, right? So I really believe that that's what it's going to take action by the workers, but also democratic movements and institutions. And, you know, I don't think this is, this is just my wishful thinking, but I think that is borne out by the evidence. So, cause where are we strong in the labor movement? Like the places that Donna mentioned, care work, education, journalism, public sector, um, airplanes, you know, all of these places either have big rank and file traditions or are undergoing worker driven organizing waves. And where we're weak, it's sectors like service where no union has tried for decades manufacturing, the trades, where they're beset with like the worst type of business union. So you have unions, you get unions like the steel workers out here who not only have given up organizing, not only have given up bringing in new members, but now have most of their workers voting for Trump. And you have like the IAF, the firefighters, who just, just uh, now they, they just voted in a fascist basically to run their union. Um, and another example of this is how the labor movement has responded to the uprising. We've seen some really good stuff out here from the teachers unions, uh, the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers out here funded one of the organizers at George Floyd Square, who is a local high school teacher, um, funded her to go on leave for a year and hang out there. Um, and the, in, out in Brooklyn Center where Dante Wright was murdered, the teachers there ran like a really big mutual aid site during the uprising there in April. Um, and the teachers, of course, have one of the strongest rank and file infrastructures, right? And so they've built the ability to be ready for this and to respond to these things. And I think you can contrast that to the actions of unions nationally, which, you know, maybe best case, uh, SEIU can talk a good game, but then we'll turn around and rep the cops that killed Richard Brooks in Atlanta. And worst case, a lot of these unions just ignore this movement completely. And that brings us to today, right? Just to restate, you know, pretty bad in some places, but I think some promising signs in a few sectors. But here's the tricky part. We have a new president now, and uh, he's on the blue team this time. And while you're going to hear some pro-labor stuff from him, and maybe, 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 you know, maybe we'll get some parts of the PRO Act written into the budget or whatever. He's going to be pretty awful on the issues that are really driving young workers today on the street, right? Racial justice, gender justice, and international issues like Palestine solidarity. And that poses a big challenge for us ahead in the labor movement, because while a lot of unions are happy to issue lip service to these things under Trump, they're not going to oppose Biden, right? Which is unfortunate because that is what these issues are, what is motivating young workers today, as I just detailed. So if we're going to get good some good labor reform, but compromise on this, we're still not gonna be able to organize anyone. And unfortunately, I don't think that the labor, that union leadership is gonna realize this. I think that instead they're gonna try and stop any dissent to Biden. And when the unions say, no, you can't protest this or oppose that, will we have the strength to stand our ground? This I think is a big question because if the unions don't stand on these, we can kiss everyone entering the workforce goodbye. But if we have no one to back us up, we'll be kicked to the curb. So I really believe that we're gonna to have to lead on this and take a stand on these issues. Um, but while there's maybe some institutions that will follow us if we do so, this is also really a moment that calls for creating and sustaining new caucuses, new networks, new unions, independent of union leadership and rooted in the rank and file so that we have our own posse that's not gonna run over to Team Blue in our hour of need. So how are we gonna do that, right? I don't claim to hold any of the answers. Well, I don't claim to hold all of the answers on that. But I will say uh, that what we're doing in, our, in Restaurant Organizing Project, maybe it'll prove to be a good model. I think it might. One idea that I have though, is to look to the spirit of the uprising. You know, I'll note that we've seen a pattern over the past year, right? Where a lot of young people are radicalizing because they go to one protest and they get tear gas. So now they're zero to 60 and they're down for any kind of direct action. And that's great, right? Um, I would though encourage those of us who fit that model to maybe think about laying down roots, building institutions, because it's gonna get tougher whether this president or the next one, maybe we go back to Team Red, maybe we stay with Team Blue, right? Meanwhile, for those of us who have been laying the groundwork, right? Who have been, who have been you know, who have been salting, who have been forming unions, who have been in this fight for a while. I wanna, I think this is a, um, a good time to think about that this past year has proven the power of quick mass direct action. So for my comrades who are rooted in, in, rooted in these places, I wanna offer a friendly challenge because this is a special moment. So when you see the youth in the streets, I think it's time to figure out how you can aid them, right? And I think we can bring that into the workplace. Always thinking about how we can respond quickly and bring that direct action energy into our organizing. And I think like 
a conscious confrontation like this, where we're bringing our traditions of organizing and resilience and merging them with a spirit of direct action, I think that's the energy we're gonna be, have to be bringing um, for the next four years, at least. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul. That was great. Um, our next speaker um, that we have is Lois Weiner. Uh, Lois is a professor emerita at New, New Jersey City University, has been an officer of three union locals, is a member of the New Politics Editorial Board, and is the author of The Future of Our Schools, Teacher Unions and Social Justice. Go ahead, Lois. Thank you. Um, can, can, can we change the screen so that I can see people? Great. Okay. Um, I hope my uh, bandwidth holds uh, uh, so that I can remain on screen with you. Um, I want to apologize for reading my remarks. Um, I found that on Zoom, it's very hard for me to do what I like to do, which is to just make a couple of notes and then expand on it. Um, I'm not sure why that is, uh, but whatever. Um, the title of my remarks today are Looking Back to Move Forward. And um, I first wanna thank the organizers of the event and to Tempest uh, because uh, this is an opportunity for me to engage with um, a group that I see as coming from the same political tradition that I did, which is the independent socialist tradition, uh, which I would describe as revolutionary democratic socialist. Um, I'm going to ground my ideas about the challenges of the moment with observations about ideas about capitalism, the working class and social oppression that I think have characterized our tradition. And my understanding of them um, has been developed through um, reading publications of the Workers' Party, of the Independent Socialist League um, and my personal involvement with comrades in the Independent Socialist Club uh, in the Berkeley campus and the community branches and in the first years of the IS. So stay with me if this, if this history isn't familiar uh, to you, okay? I think you'll see how it connects. Um, in jettisoning Trotsky's theory of the Soviet Union as a degenerated worker state and theorizing instead the communist regimes represented a historically new social formation the Independent Socialist League, the ISL, returned to an idea that was lost in Marxism and I think is ignored today. Capitalism is a social system. It is not only a method of organizing economic and political relations. And as I explain more fully in an article, I'm gonna to try to send you everybody the link in the chat. I hope it's in my buffer. Yeah, um, as I explain, I hope more fully in this article, understanding capitalism as a social system allows us to see that social oppression has been baked into it. Therefore, it centers struggles for freedom, equality and justice in all our political activity as socialists, as opponents of capitalism, including our work as in unions. Therefore, social justice issues don't have to be exported or imported. They are present when we look at the conditions of work because social oppression is embedded in capitalism, patriarchy, racism, xenophobia, ableism are inescapable in how work is configured and paid. Social oppression is not external to work and workers' organizations. And so struggles for social justice don't have to be imported, they're there. We, know only, we need only to see the manifestations and use them in our organizing. And so I would reverse the relationship identified in the Te Tempest Statement Principles and say the fight for the fullest democracy on the job and in the society informs working class self-activity. Working class self-activity, the class becoming a class in and of itself, as I think so many historians have shown, in particular E.P. Thompson, I think, 
requires requires that we that we understand who workers are and and what work is about so the idea of social oppression being baked into capitalism also relates to how and why the working class is the agent of social transformation. And I think that's also often blurry. Um, we look to workers because of their actual and potential power to alter society by exercising their power at the workplace. And therefore to make improvements in their work lives, workers need to organize collectively. And in doing this, they automatically challenge capitalism's ideological and economic motors. This reality more than any social characteristics of workers themselves explains why we look to the working class and to workers. The final issue I want to address is how we understand socialists entering unions to organize, which relates to how we define the working class. And I want to solidarize myself with Donna's characterization of the nostalgia that has led to a mischaracterization uh, of the working class. But I think that for our tradition, I think we need to see that this, this is not, this mistake goes way back. The nostalgia goes back decades and decades. And here, I wanna point to an interview that Kent Worcester did with Julie and Phyllis Jacobson. I'll send people the link in a minute. Um, it was an interview with them in the early 90s. And Phyllis and, and Julie, who are members of the Workers' Party and the ISL, say this in the interview. There were some things we did as the Workers' Party which we never would have done operating as the League. For example, in the early years, we had a policy of sending our members, mostly young people, into industry. And it was wrong because a lot of people weren't psychologically prepared for it. People were talked into leaving white collar jobs or college to take jobs in shops. And then they go on to talk about one of the aims of the industrialization policy was to catch up with what the communist party had done so much earlier, blah, blah, blah. We also told people that they had to leave New York and go to Cleveland or Detroit or Buffalo, which is what people did. I suggest exactly the same error was made in the turn to the working class in the 1970s. Exactly the same mistake. Activists in white collar unions who often had significant influence in reform caucuses left their jobs to industrialize. Only a few comrades were left in unions that have subsequently become the largest in the US labor movement, including the AFT and NEA. Though no single factor explains why this mistake was repeated, I think one key element was unwillingness to challenge orthodoxies about what defines work and the working class, orthodoxies that are related to social oppression, gender, and race. And as Don explained, the strike waves of teachers in red states and blue states blue cities in the past few years is both explanation of evidence of the mistake. Another piece of evidence of the mistake is the mushrooming organizing among cultural and knowledge workers, the guild, museum workers, technical work, right? So we need to understand that the working class has changed. And that changes in the working class also relate to changes in capitalism globally. Capitalism is always one step ahead of us, always. We're reactive, Rosa Luxemburg discusses that. And the pandemic has intensified the reality. In a speech a decade ago, a decade ago at York University, Ursula Hughes, I really encourage people to read her work. Book in 2014, it's available in a PDF. <clears throat> who she researches how information technology transforms work in the global supply chain. Ursula observed that by the time the UK unions realized outsourcing was occurring and asked for her assistance because she was a consultant, the process has been completed. All the unions could do was negotiate defeat. While outsourcing continues along with older forms of privatization, work has already been transformed again in ways unions are just starting to see, right? Information technology has, has altered work 
It's not just deindustrialization. De That's old. Deindustrialization is old, comrades. We have to look to the future, right? The way work has already been changed. Now I want to say the rhetoric about Biden being the most progressive president in modern history occurs with a stunning lack of specifics about his legislation. It's, it's incredible how little detail we have. One issue is the extent to which federal funding is going to intensify privatization through public and private partnerships. How are these jobs going to be created, right? How are they gonna be paid for? Another key question is how Biden's economic policies are enacting capitalism's global use of information technology to transform work, increase profits, and strengthen the power of the ruling class politically. The 2021 World Development Report issued by the World Bank, its global plan for ameliorating poverty, is titled Data for Better Lives. It explains the plan for us. So missing in all of the discussion of labor about money being challenged to job creation is how information technology is altering work, how it's intensifying surveillance and how workers are training their new replacements, which are not workers in India, they are robots and AI. And incidentally, I wanna say New Politics has an article coming out in our next issue about how these is, this issue of information technology and ed tech relate to contingent labor and corporatization in higher education. Uh, it's a must read as far as I'm concerned for academic activists in, uh, in higher education. Lois, you're close to time. I wanna say that Biden and the Democrats are enjoying a predictably overlong honeymoon, but the romance is starting to fade. Already the most vocal advocates of passing the PRO Act as a solution to labor's organizing failures acknowledge in passing it may not have the votes to pass, despite the Democrats' legislative majorities in the House, Senate, and the presidency. This is a moment when socialists can be encouraged to find work that allows them to organize learning from and with their peers to democratize their workplaces. But I think that process requires alertness to the way social oppression is reflected in and reinforced by the way work is organized as well as cultural and organizational norms of unions. In the dialectical process of theory and practice, we clarify our ideals by intervening in struggles, learning, I hope, from our successes and our defeats. No one can predict how or when we will see a massive resurgence of worker self-activity or emergence of powerful social movements demanding human liberation. The only verity is that they will occur. Thank you so much, Lois. Um, so that takes us to the end of our presentation portion and we are going to be turning off the live Facebook stream. Um, so Natalia, if you want to put the link in the chat for people to connect on to this uh, discussion portion, that would be great. I also want to link, put some links in the chat for people who want more information about Tempest Collective. So in two weeks, we're going to be having an intro to Tempest Collective. So for people who are thinking about joining, have recently joined, have questions, this is going to be a great opportunity to talk to Tempest Collective members about what we're doing how we organize. Um, so I just put that in the chat for everybody. And then if you're familiar with um, the, you know, our writing and um, our politics and you want to join us, I'm going to put a link in the chat right now um, for people who want to find out how they can join our group. Um, so now we're going to open it up to a discussion, uh, which means Anybody who wants to participate